Okay, so lecture 26. Today, I want to continue our discussion about polymorphism and classes. And I really want to distinguish the difference between a couple of key concepts as it relates to inheritance. And certainly this has relevance on the last homework, which you don't have to audit for. The homework seven is just do the instructions and turn it in. But hint, hint, about a third of the final is based off of homework seven. So don't just simply ignore it. Um, but uh, I really want to go into the concepts of a uh, concrete classes versus abstract classes, but also talk about interfaces versus abstract. So we should have a strong understanding of all the constituent parts that allow us to start building using interfaces and classes by the time, using inheritance by the time we're done this lecture. So if you recall last class, and I believe this has already been published, so everyone has had a chance to review over that lecture, we were starting to motivate why we need abstract classes. So we're gonna start back from that point. And we're gonna re-motivate that concept because that was like four or five days ago, right? So let's start here, abstract classes versus concrete classes. I wanna motivate the use of abstract. I wanna introduce the abstract keyword. I wanna give you a strategy on when should something be abstract versus when should it be concrete. And hint, the strategy is given right there. We're gonna use abstract classes when we need to group a collection of related classes together. And we'll take a, a, and look at an example of that. Uh, and so I want to, when we look at abstract class, I want you to hold that in your mind so that when we get to interfaces, I want you to be able to try to identify when might you use an interface instead. And then finally, we will contrast between abstract classes versus concrete classes. And then we will contrast between abstract classes and interfaces. So let's go and actually look at a real world practical example using source code. So uh, I'm gonna have some source code here. I don't, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this particular one because it's not relevant to the inheritance hierarchy, but I will just briefly mention it because it'll give us that uh, composition. So we can use both competition, uh, composition and inheritance at the same time in the same class. So we can have a class that has a reference to another class. Remember composition is a has a relationship. And we can also have a class that is a type of another class that uses that is a relationship. So we're gonna actually build a pretty well-defined class. We're gonna build an employee class that uses both composition and inheritance. So let's start by using one of the component classes. Every employee we're gonna say is gonna to have to have a, a date. We'll see what that means in just a moment, but let's go ahead and just define this. So here, not too much time to discuss this, just the fact that we have this date class. A date class will have a uh, an integer array that is a days per month. So we pad out month zero because that doesn't make any sense. But inside this initializer list, just notice that for each numbered month, that's the number of days that's there. That'll be used to for our modeling, right? So when we go to model a date, all of the concerns we have is trying to ensure our data model is in a valid or invalid state. And typically, if we're going to do a date, a date's probably going to be very similar to a time, right? So remember, in time, we've used integers as the foundation, as the fundamental data type to represent an hour, to represent a minute, to represent a second. So we can use the same kind of approach if we were to model a date. A date could be thought of as having a year component, having a month component and having a day component. And each one of those on a calendar can be expressed as a number or it could be expressed as a string. So when we go to select our data model here, I just opted to do a number, but months can be either numerical states or string states, right? I could say it's January or I could say it's the first month. 
And to you, you probably can translate in your mind really rapidly one to the other. All right, you've been conditioned for that. So in this instance, I'm just going to use uh, a similar metaphor as what we did with time. So year, month, day, I'm gonna have a constructor that allows me to set a date. It's gonna take in the day, the month, and the year. I'm gonna have all these setter methods. I mean, all these getter methods that are gonna get back the state of any one of those attributes, I'll get back a year, get back a month, get back a day. I'll have a two string method that allows me to express my date as a string. I'll have a set date method, which is going to be very similar principally on what we did with our set time method, where it's going to take in the three numerical values, one that represents the day, one that represents the month, one that represents the year, and then it's going to call the setter method for each one of those individual values. And the setter method, that's where we're going to ensure that the value that's being passed in is valid towards our data model. So here, we're just going to say that in order to be a valid year, it has to be um, uh, 1900, right? So if, if, if it is before 1900 in our application, we're going to consider that not a valid year. If we want to check the month, we'll check to make sure that the month is between 1 to 12. If it's not between 1 to 12, we're going to throw that exception. Right. So if the month, so again, we look for those exceptional cases. If you try to pass in a month that's zero or negative, if you try to pass in a month that's 13 or greater, then we're going to go ahead and throw uh, an exception at that client code. And the same thing with set day. And notice with set day, that's where we're going to use that days per month array that we saw at the very beginning. We're going to pass in, we're going to see, in order to see if the day is valid, we have to have set the month first. We can only ever set the day after we've set the month, but we'll use the month numerical value as an index into that array to see how many days that that month has. And if it's more than that, then we're going to say, oh, that month doesn't have that many days. And if it's less than or equal to zero, then we're going to say that's not a valid uh, number for a day on a calendar. So this is just a really quick component class that we're going to use to build out an employee in our example. And it's really similar to, uh, to our time class, really. Okay, so now let's make a employee. Okay, and so now employee, like I said, is going to use composition. So, right, so let's say we're building a payment system for a local cafe where you might pay the manager by salary, you might pay some of the workers uh, based off of an hourly pay, and maybe they have some who also work on commission based off of uh, advertising or trying to secure like contracts with local businesses to export higher volumes of coffee. So let's say there's three different payment schemes that an employee could potentially have. So we're going to start modeling out our application so that we can create this payment system. So that's going to be the motivation behind this example. I always like to tether our academic examples into like a real world type of environment. So here we'll create a employee class and some of the properties that every employee might have would be a name, right? An address. Both of those could be represented as strings. And then the entire reason why we had just added that date class was because likely every employee is going to have to have a birth date and also a higher date. So that's four properties that we could say are pretty critical to every employee inside of our payment system. When I go and create a constructor, the role of a constructor is to set up and initialize an instance where it gives values to all of the instance fields, all the instance variables. So I'm going to have an explicit constructor, which means that the parameter list actually requires the client code to pass in values. So here, every time we create a new employee, we have to give that employee a name. We have to give that employee an address. We have to give that employee a birth date and a hire date. And we set those values 
from the local parameter list, those local variables, to the instance fields here. Remember using that this keyword. Then we'll create a getter method to be able to get the name of an employee. And we'll create a two string method that will go ahead and just print out the state of an employee as a string. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions up to this point? Or does this look relatively, and I can stretch this out a little bit more, does this look relatively simple enough? Okay. So let's start building out our inheritance hierarchy where we can start saying a salary employee is a type of employee. Because if, uh, let's see here. So let's go and create. Okay, so here we have salaryemployee.java. Let's go over here and actually let's change this view icons perfect okay so inside of salary employee salary employee is going to extend employee so i'm going to use that extends keyword like what we've seen in the prior lecture so extends goes at the same level it's a top level keyword, which means it goes on the same line that your class definition would go. And here it allows us to establish a hierarchy. We can say that every salary employee is now also a employee. If super class, its parent class is the employee, employee class. If super class, its direct parent is no longer object. If we don't say a class extends some other class, then by default, it is object. So for instance, an employee here, we don't say it extends any other class. So by default, employee extends object. And so through an indirect inheritance hierarchy, our salary employee extends employee, which itself extends object. So a employee is also, a salary employee is also an object as well. Hence, when we said everything in Java is an object, which is why we always get that two string method. It's why we always get an equals method. Okay, so in our constructor, for a salary employee, we're gonna have to request all the data that its parent class needs, which is an employee, because remember, a salary employee is a type of employee, which means that if we said every employee needs to have a name, every employee needs to have a address and a hire date and a birth date, then surely when we create a salary employee, we need that data. So we're gonna have that defined inside of our constructor, but in addition, to the base data that every employee requires. We're also gonna have this last parameter here that's gonna be the salary. And we're gonna think of that as an annual salary. And so the first thing I'm gonna do inside of my constructor for salary employee is I'm going to construct the inner instance of its super class. So if you could think of it as like one of those Russian nesting dolls, Right, the inner class, the, the parent class goes inside, and you build all the instance variables related to the employee class. And then outside of that, we'll then go all of the instance fields for this subclass. So here we're going to use the super keyword to invoke the constructor, since that constructor requires these values to get passed in name, address, birth, and hire. And then we're going to go ahead and set the one new instance variable that defines a salary employee, that distinguishes a salary employee from every other employee. That's going to be the salary instance field. So we're going to set that in our constructor. Then I'm going to create some new methods that only make sense for a salary employee. Like for instance, now we can say an employee can get earnings. It didn't make sense to define get earnings inside of employee yet because we didn't know how they got paid. They didn't have any, any like income stream yet. But now a salary allows us to define a get earnings. And if our earnings is an annual salary, and if this is designed to create a paycheck and you get paid every like twice a month, then maybe what we can say is take the salary, divide it by 12, because that'll give you your monthly income. And if you get paid 
twice a month, divide that by two. So that's what we're going to define as being able to get the earnings for any given pay period on a salaried employee. And then what we'll do is we'll also, in order to be able to check the state of our salary employee, we're going to, is this overriding or is this overloading the two string method? So overloading is when you have multiple methods with the same name, but different parameter lists. Overriding is when we have two methods of the same name with the same parameter list, but they're in the inheritance hierarchy. So if I create a two-string method that has the name two-string and it doesn't take in any parameters in the subclass, it's going to override the two-string method that's in my employee class, which itself is going to override the two-string method that's inside the object class. So this is going to be an example of method overriding. And I guarantee you, there's probably a question related to overriding versus overloading in the final. Very important concept. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so is there any questions related to the salary employee? So why do you use return lines rather than return lines? So the question was, why do I use return return lines? So that's a great question. So the question is, why am I constantly returning data as opposed to simply printing it to the console? And it's because the console printing is not how applications typically deliver data. Console printing is typically for you, the developer, to validate and verify what's happening inside your software. But if you print to the console, you're not really doing anything meaningful with the data, right? You're just displaying it for that one small moment of time. Typically in our applications, the way our applications work, especially in an object-oriented approach, is that our instances talk with other instances. And they talk with each other through this metaphor of message passing. Message passing happens when one instance invokes another instance methods, right? So the methods are the smallest unit of code that we've learned how to develop. And these codes are called upon from, e from instances we construct inside of the application. And as the life cycle of our application kind of steps through, multiple instances are communicating with other instances. Objects are talking with other objects. And so when we return data, what we're doing is that method is giving an actual piece of data, like in-memory values inside Java, to some other place in our code. And so that's what really allows for message for objects to cross-communicate and share data within our application. So Again, typically, we only do the console printing when we're inspecting to see if our logic's correct. But when our application is actually running, we don't ever actually want to just print to the console because that's not how you interface with your end user. When was the last time you've actually ran an application where it was all console driven? I would wager to say most like 99%, maybe 99.9% .9 of the applications out there are event-driven and windowed base, right? Like every application that you use on your cell phone, for instance, is one that uses icons and widgets and windows, right? Where you can tap on something and something happens in response. That's not using any console logs, right? That's not using any system.out.prints. That's using data that's getting passed around underneath the scenes. So here we want to start migrating away from our very early days when we were kind of experimenting and using system.out.print to display what was happening inside of our methods, to display what was happening inside of our code. And we want to start thinking of that as being an invisible thing that's happening underneath the scenes. And we want to start using return values when we need to send data from one place to another. Because again, when we print it out, we're not really sending it anywhere, we're just displaying it. So here, when I, when I call get earnings inside of a salary employee, I want to be able to request from that instance of salary employee, what are your earnings? 
so that my other application, the one that's actually going to print the, the paychecks, can get that value and then put it on a check. Or for instance, because we're not actually going to do the check printing inside the instance, right? The instance just manages the data that defines its instance fields. Anything more than that, and it's outside of its responsibility. That's a big thing. I don't know if I've mentioned that enough, that guides our object-oriented design principles, but you only put so much implementation in each object for what that object's role in the software is. So again, if we're going to build a paycheck printer, and we have salary employee, it should not be the responsibility of salary employee to actually print paychecks, just to manage the data for a salary employee. Does that much make sense? So by having this return statement allows us to manage this data inside a salary employee, but then give it to the appropriate object that will then use the earnings to print the paycheck. Excellent question. And same thing with return. With the two string here, we claim we're gonna return back a string. So I have to do a return statement that gives me back a string value. I can't just, the only way I don't have a return is if it's void. So that's another big thing to recall. Anytime you declare that a method gives back a value, it has to have a return statement as the very last line of code in that method. In fact, once you have created a return statement, you can't put any lines of code after that. Because if you do, it'll never execute because the return actually gives control back to whatever invoked it. Excellent. Any other questions? Excellent. So is everyone happy with salary employees? Does everyone see now because of this extends keyword, how salary employee is now a type of employee? So everything that's inside of employee, salary employee also has, but it also has a salary. So now let's move on then to motivate this concept because we still haven't gotten to the abstract yet, the abstract class, but we're gonna get there. Let's move on to the other type of employee, the hourly employee. Okay. Let's go over here, find where our hourly employee is. We'll open up inside of our Syntax highlighter, our text editor here. Okay, so hourly employee isn't going to be too different conceptually with how we implement it. Salary employee is going to have the considerations what makes an hourly employee different than just the super class employee, right? So every hourly employee is going to be a type of employee. We're going to use that extends hierarchy. This is the subclass. This is the superclass. Every hourly employee is going to have an hourly rate, which we can represent as a double value. And it's going to have an hours worked that we can represent as a double value. If I was really stringent and if I was a good software engineer and not simply a developer, when I go to set hourly rate and hours worked, I should probably guarantee that those are positive right? That those are non-negative values. You shouldn't be able to work negative hours. You shouldn't be able to have a negative amount to pay. But I'm not, I don't have that in these slides. So just know this isn't what a software engineer would have developed. This is the difference between a software engineer and a software developer. So here, sometimes there are bad coding practices in these slides. I want to highlight this is one of those times. You should look at the slides and see if they're consistently applying engineering principles. And when you find they don't, then that means you've learned something. Then you've seen even these slides sometimes aren't following all the rules that you should if you're building truly good software. Okay, so with that said, here we're just gonna blindly set the hour, hourly rate and the hours worked with whatever the value is, because this we're not, we're not going to uh, update that code. We wanna focus in on what this lecture is going to be about, concrete classes versus abstract classes. Here, we're also going to have a get earnings. So notice our get earnings is going to be defined behaviorally different than in salary uh, employees. So they both have a method called get earnings. Now, subclasses are sibling classes. They don't have any real direct relation between each other. They share a parent, 
which is the employee, but other than that, they are distinct and individual classes in and of themselves. Just like if I were to compare this with mammals, right? Like cats and dogs are both mammals. They're sibling subclasses in the mammal categorization, right? There's not necessarily a shared behavior. I mean, a, a shared uh, uh, relation between them, except that they're both qualify as mammals. So. Well, my question would be, given the next job class, which would be commission, you could have commission of both salary and hourly and their sibling classes. So would it be an extend or would you also then just add another public double get earnings, add something within the get earnings that would connect with the sibling class and commission? So since, so that's a good question. And so this all is one of the things that there is no truly right or wrong answer to in terms of design in terms of design work. So typically what I would say in this instance, when we're modeling an employee and then you have multiple uh, subcategories that an employee can actually concretely be. So when we say you, you are an employee, I have an implication there that the employee has to either be a salary, it has to be hourly, or it has to be commission-based. And so what I what you should do is you should model all the concrete classes as subclasses to the super class. So if commission employee conceptually is one of the sub members alongside hourly and alongside commission uh, and alongside hourly and salary, uh, then you should you should implement it. Even if the behavior is going to be very similar to the hourly employee, and it is, right? So for hourly employee, we have two instance fields that are numerical, right? Hourly rate and hours worked, and the get earnings just multiplies those two. What you're gonna notice is a commission employee is gonna have two numerical fields, right? It's gonna be your commission rate and the number of sales you have, and your get earnings is going to be to take the two numbers and multiply them together. You take your commission rate and you multiply it by your total sales. So logically, the way we implement both these classes is the same. Technically, I could just pass in commission rates and total sales into an hourly employee, and that would produce the correct answer, but it breaks the modeling. And let's say somewhere down the line, we actually have to have a distinguishable difference between methods that are defined in a commission employee and methods that are defined inside an hourly employee, all of a sudden we lose that flexibility. So when we start planning out our software from the get-go, regardless of how it gets implemented, we wanna keep our modeling decisions as clear and as expressive as possible. Does, does that kind of answer your question? You can't extend a sibling class. No, you can't extend. You can, now a sibling class can be extended into a subclass in and of itself, but then you would be a member of that sibling class. So like, so let's say for instance, I had an hourly employee that can also potentially have commission. So I can have a commission-based hourly employee. So there's an hourly amount, but you know, if you sell like merchandise, you get commission on top of that. Then what I could do in that instance is I can have an hourly employee, then I can create a commission hourly employee, and a commission hourly employee would be predominantly an hour employee, so I can extend hourly employee, and then I can add in the new instance fields that define the commission rate and the total sales. And then a commission hourly employee is also a type of hourly employee, but with the ad additional benefit of being able to add commission. So I could do that, but it's not creating any kind of connection between siblings. You're just taking the model of a commission and bolting that on top of the hourly employee. So you're creating a tree that goes down where it's uh, where it has. A sibling can be its own parent. That's right. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. A sibling can be a parent itself to its children classes. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be, there's no direct relationship from hourly to commission. There's no direct relationship between hourly and salary. Okay, let's go to.
Okay, so now let's go to commission. And like I said before, when I was motivated, you didn't see it. We were talking about it. Now you get to see it. Here's commission employee that extends employee. So these are all subtypes of employee. A commission employee has a rate, a commission rate and a total number of sales. So notice these are two numerical values. We have to define a constructor. So a commission employee needs all the same data an employee needs. But in addition to that, it also needs a rate and sales. And we're going to go ahead and set that. And again, if I was truly implementing sound software engineering principles, I would validate that this is not negative, right? That this is as that it has to be a positive value. But we're going to skip that step to keep the code light. So we can start focusing on other parts. And then I'll have a two-string method so we can inspect the state of our uh, commission employee. Now, notice, and this is on purpose, this is going to motivate something that's going to happen in the future that we haven't gotten to. But I want you to recognize this now. What did we not put in commission employee that went into salary employee and that went into hourly employee? This will see how much y'all have been paying attention to the implementation on the other two classes. Do I have all the methods? I'm missing one, right? Which one? Yeah, get earnings. Get earnings. So, and probably that's not on purpose. Probably that's a mistake because we probably want to get the earnings for a commission employee. But I want to motivate what happens, why we use certain things in the language that will alert this to us. So I know right now, we don't have a get earnings, and that's purposely done to be an accident later on so that we can get more information. But I'm highlighting that. I'm, putting, I'm bringing everyone into that secret right now so you know where the bug is in my logic, where there's an omission that shouldn't be omitted there. Okay, so with that said, let's go into our employee tester. And so here, I'm going to create an employee tester, and then we're going to step through this code. Okay, so I have an employee tester. Here it is. Let's open it up. Oh, no, that's not quite right. I should spell employee correctly. Okay, now let's open up the correct one. Perfect. Okay, so inside of Employee Tester, this is gonna be an application class. It's gonna contain a main method that will allow us to construct instances of the various subtypes of employees, the concrete types of employees, hourly, salary, and commission, and then start making the logic that will print out the paychecks. So let's see what's going to happen. So I'm going to have employee tester. I have the main method. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a salary employee that we'll refer to in our code as Kim. And then we're going to invoke the constructor so that we can actually create an instance of Kim here. We need to pass in all of the different values into the constructor. So Kim has to have a name, Kim Kimmy. Kim has to have an ad address, 123 Main Street. Kim has to have a birth date, which remember is day, month, year. So August 18th, 1955. Kim needs to have a higher date. So September 9th, 1999. And since Kim is a salary employee, Kim will have an annual salary of 50,000. Okay, so that's gonna represent our manager effectively. And then it looks like we have two hourly employees. So we're gonna create a variable uh, called Jim that is an hourly employee. And then we're gonna call the constructor on Jim, hourly employee. So Jim needs to have a name, Jim Jimmy. Jim needs to have an address, 345 Second Street. Jim needs to have a birth date which is gonna be September 24th, 2000. Jim needs to have a higher date, which is gonna be December 12, 2012. And Jim is an 
hourly employee. So Jim has hourly rate of $15 and Jim has worked 20 hours or has a 20 hour schedule. And then we will save this instance of Jim there. Then we're gonna have a second hourly employee inside of our fictitious cafe called Tim. Here, we're gonna do the same thing we did with Jim, but with all of Tim's information. Here we have Tim Tim, the name, Tim's address, 1010 3rd Street. Tim was born July 7th, 1988. Tim's hire date was January 14th, 2016. And Tim's hourly rate is $25 an hour, but only works five hours a week. And then finally, we're gonna have a commission employee, Sam, where we will invoke the commission employee constructor. We need, Sam needs a name, Sam Sampson. Sam needs an address, 999 4th Street. Sam needs a birth date of, here it's gonna be January 1st, 1998. Sam needs a hire date, December 24th, 2020, Christmas Eve, interesting day to hire somebody, start. And uh, Sam's commission rate is going to be 25%. That'll be represented as 0.25 and Sam's sales will be 5,000. Excellent. So let's talk about polymorphism. One awesome thing about the inheritance hierarchy. So when we use that extends keyword, so that, uh, so that salary employee, hourly employee, and commission employee are all parts of employee, what I can do here is create an employee array and then I can put all of my employees. And the motivating concept is inside my payment system here, I need to process a paycheck for all of my employees, regardless of whether they're hourly, salary, or commission-based. So instead of having three different for loops, one just for commission employees, one just for hourly employees, one just for uh, uh, salary employees, that would violate my drive principle. What makes us, what makes it better is using the super class as opposed to the subclass. So I can group all of my subclasses into the parent class classification of employee, and now I can hold them together. So here I'm gonna create an initializer list, and in my initializer list, I'm gonna put Kim, which is a salary employee, Jim, which is an hourly employee, Tim, which is an hourly employee, and uh, Sam, which is a commission employee. And they're all gonna be inside this employee array. And what's great about that is I can use this enhanced for loop. And so an enhanced for loop, recall, on the right-hand side is the name of our array. On the left-hand side is a local variable that iterates through each element in the array and just stores as a local variable of that data type. So if this is an employee array, I can access each of the employees at the employee level. Now, we've, we've stated this before, but I'm gonna reiterate because it's really important when it comes to inheritance. When we, when we say, when we access something, when we store something at the employee level, at the super class level, the only methods we have available to us are going to be the ones that are defined inside the employee class, right? So, so here, when I iterate through each employee, if I want to go ahead and print out a check, and let's say, let's say I have, I'm, let's say I'm going to do this based off of subclasses. So I'm going to show you the bad way first, and then we're going to motivate. So one way we could do this is I could create a method and I can overload it. So here, notice on line 21, I have a print employee paycheck. On line 25, I also have a print employee paycheck. Both these methods are the same with their name, but their parameters are different. They take two different classes. One takes an hourly employee, the other takes a salary employee. Now, inside of my hourly employee, I'm gonna call worker.getEarnings, on my salary employee here, I'm going to uh, do worker.getEarnings. Why am I doing it this way instead of just calling employee? Well, we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. But here, here, notice I'm going to have two different methods. I'll kind of give you the cheater answer here. It's because I want to call get earnings. Get earnings is defined inside of an hourly employee. Get earnings is defined inside of a salary employee. Get earnings is not defined inside of an employee, so I can't call it from the employee level. 
So if I want to be able to get the earnings for, for the subclass and I have put it into a container that treats it as its super class, as the employee class, then what I need to do is cast it down. So look at what I'm doing here. So I'm going to walk through for each employee, let's say worker inside of employees, I will see if that worker is an instance of hourly employee. And if it is, then I can safely cast it into an hourly employee. That's what's happening in line 10. I'm creating a local variable of data type hourly employee that I'll call hourly. And I'm gonna assign it a casting operation where I'm gonna take something from the scope of its parent class, right? It's a worker is an employee, but since I use this keyword instance of, instance of allows me to get a Boolean response, true or false, worker is also an hourly employee. So it allows me to see if something at the employee level is a particular subclass. So think of it as like a Venn diagram, right? So hourly employee, salary employee, commission employee are all types of employee. They can all be grouped together. But sometimes then I need to make decisions related to what that subcategorization is. I can actually use instance of and take something at the employee scope because employee could be hourly, it could be commission or it could be salary, right? So if I want it just to be hourly, I could say, is the worker an hourly employee instance of? And if it is also an instance of hourly employee, I can safely cast it. And now that I have an hourly employee, I actually have access to that get earnings method because that's where that's defined at. So does everyone see what's happening there? And so I could do this also for salary employees. So, right, like, because they're all sibling classes. So there's no way for me to batch this together like I did with employee. So does everyone see this works? I can run it, but do you see how clunky this is? This isn't a good solution, but I'm just illustrating we can do it this way. But it violates dry, doesn't it? Let's clear this. Let's actually test it. Oh, let's compile it. Now let's test it. Okay, so this actually works. We printed out Kim Kimmy's payment. We printed out Jim and Tim uh, Tim's payment, right? So Kim's payment got processed here. Tim and Jim's here. And notice we didn't print out Sam's because we didn't add implementation for Sam. So that illustrates this is working the way we expect, right? The ones we're checking for, we send to this helper method for hourly employee and salary employee. And in fact, if I tried to do this for Sam, that would fail. Sam doesn't have to get earnings inside of commission employee. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about this so far? Does this make sense at least? We're about to see a much better way. So what we would like to do is instead of doing all this nonsense, what would be better is if we could do something like this, if we can be polymorphic from the super class. Just like we can group everything, just like we can group everything by employee, wouldn't it be great if we can also go ahead and make this an employee as well. So instead, and then we can just have the one, right? And if any employee, I should be able to go ahead and print a paycheck for, right? All employees get paid, right? But the problem is, how do they get paid at the employee level? So let's see what happens when I, I just, actually, let's, so let's see, let's just see quick update to this code. All this is the same. We still have Kim, we still have Jim, we still have Tim, we still have Sam. We're going to do our, our polymorphic behavior where we're going to group all of our subclasses into a parent class, into a categorization of data type employee. We're still going to do that for loop, but wouldn't this make our code much nicer where we can, instead of having the subclasses of hourly employee and salary employee, where even though that worked, wouldn't it be nicer just to have an employee? Because now look at what our logic looks like. It's much simpler, right? But if I try to do this, is this going to work? Will this compile? And like, don't spend too much time. Just give me your first impression. Should this work? Yeah. It should work, right? It should, but it's not. And we're going to find out why. But ideally, there's no reason why this shouldn't. Like what, what we want to do is that, 
But when I go to compile this, what's going to happen is I get this error. And what's this error? It says it cannot find symbol. It cannot find get earnings inside of worker. Because what is worker? Worker is an employee. And I look at my method list. Okay, where is get earnings inside of employee? I have a constructor. I have a get name. I have a two string. That's the issue, right? The issue, the reason why we had to implement it that really clunky way where we had everything in an employee array, but then we had to cast it down into its subtype so that we can access that get earnings. So what's a, what's, what's a hack? Let's start with a hack. What's a hack for us to be able to go ahead and get this implementation to work? Let's see how strong you can think in terms of, okay, I'll tell you, would this work? I'm gonna show you something complete hack. I'm going to show you why we don't do this as well. Could I do what, what do we get back on uh, get earnings double? So we're going to, we're going to create a get earnings because that's what it wants. Right. And we know that you should never have just an employee, right? That every employee is really just the super class for all these other types of employees, hourly employee, commission employee, and salary employee. But if we just define the method here and let's say give it a dummy implementation, like just maybe it returns zero, then it's defined and then we can override it inside of each of its subclasses. So it never actually uses this dummy implementation. That might work, right? Why is this bad? Okay, hang on. First, let's see if this works. Let's see if it lets me compile. It does. Now, let's test and we'll see why this is bad. But before I test, before I illustrate, does anyone have a guess why this is not the way we want to go with this? What I'm showing you is not the solution. It'll work, but what makes it a bad solution? Well, the subclasses will override. So inside of employee, employee is the super class. And the reason why we can't call get earnings is because there's no method called get earnings inside of an employee. So what we wanted to do, so what, what motivated the other uh, solution, which was this really clunky one, I had to check to see if each thing was an instance of a subclass, and then I had to cast it, and then that unlocked get earnings for me. But, but what I want to do is have this much cleaner logic and I'm like, well, I can get that much cleaner logic. All I need is for employee to have get earnings method inside of its scope. Because then at the employee scope, I can call that method. The reason why this doesn't work currently, if I look at the code or uh, I cleared it Oh, here, uh, if I look at my old error message, it's that an employee doesn't have a get earnings method. So if I put a get earnings method, and just give it a dummy implementation, like you know, return zero. That's that's just that's just a um, that's just a, a, a non-meaningful implementation. What we have is the expectation that salary employee, which extends employee, will override get earnings with its own behavior, and that hourly employee will override get earnings with its own behavior. And when we call that, even if we're treating them as an employee level, the overrided method is the one that gets called. So even if I have an employee variable, but it's filled with a salary employee, it's filled with a commission employee, it will use the logic from the commission employee, it'll use the logic from the hourly employee as opposed to my dummy logic, right? But why is this dangerous? And remember, I gave you a hint as to what we omitted in one of our prior classes. What what class, what was commission employee missing? Well, let's see. Let's see what happens when we run this. And I think you'll remember. So here, this works almost. We have Kim Kimmy's payment as two thousand eighty three dollars. Jim Jimmy's payment as three hundred. Tim Timmy's as one hundred twenty five. But poor Samson here is getting paid zero. Why is Samson getting paid zero? That's right. We forgot to actually put get earnings in there. And so we inherited the dummy methods that was never supposed to actually execute. 
So now, because we forgot to implement it inside of our subclass, poor Sam isn't going to get a paycheck. And Sam's going to be mad at who? He's going to be mad at all of you because you implemented the payment system and you forgot to give them an earnings. Okay, so there's a better approach. This is gonna motivate, this is gonna motivate this concept of abstract methods. So an abstract method is one that we know we need to have in a class in order for polymorphism to work, but we don't know how it should be defined yet. And so we don't wanna give it a body because we wanna guarantee that every subclass implements it. So what I can do to fix this is I'm like, oh no, you don't get a body at all. I know that you, every employee has to have a get earnings, but I want that to be an abstract method, which means I can declare it. I can declare it inside this class, but I don't have to define it. And so now because it's declared as abstract, I can call on it, but the disadvantage is now that I have an abstract method, this isn't a concrete class anymore. Because to be a concrete class, all of your methods have to be well-defined. They have to be implemented. So as soon as I have at least one abstract method, I have to go up here to my class and also make it abstract. And the consequence of making a class abstract is that I can't ever directly call its constructor and create an instance of it. I can only instantiate it from one of its children classes that do come behind it and implement that missing method, like get earnings in this case. So I can never actually create a direct instance of employee. I can only ever make an hourly employee, a salary employer, commission employee, but that's what we wanted to begin with, right? because employee is kind of missing some critical information. And look, we do this in the real world. Let me go back to that example with mammals. I'm gonna ask you to think of a mammal. And the only thing you can actually think of are concrete examples, because a mammal doesn't exist, right? It's an abstraction. It's an abstract clustering of concrete things that are actually objects, that are actually animals, that are actually, well, what we call mammals, like it'd be cats and dogs, and, and monkeys, and humans, and squirrels, and rats, and nutria, right? All of those might be examples of a mammal, but we only ever used the subclass, the concrete class, when, when talking about these things, right? Mammal is a kind of abstraction for something else. So the same way we think and organize thoughts in abstract ways in English is the same way we do it in code. We can never create an instance of employee now because it's abstract. And the reason that it's abstract is it's missing something. So on the case of mammals, we might say mammals are defined by a set of shared characteristics. But the reason why a mammal can't be an actual animal is we might say that all mammals are have the ability to move. I'm like, well, how does a mammal move? And like, well, it depends on what it is. If it's a dog, it's going to like run, but if it's a bat, it can fly, right? You can actually have flying mammals. So you actually have to go rely on the concrete class to define what it means to move as a mammal. So just like we have to rely on the, the concrete class, the, the subclass, hourly employee, salary employer, commission employee to determine how are they gonna get their earnings? So is this making sense? So every abstract has to be Right, so every abstract class now relies on some class to come behind it, to extend it, and then implement that abstract. So watch, yeah, so if I go, so at this point, let's try to compile employee tester, let's try to run employee tester. And here, we're gonna say, I was able to successfully go ahead and print out Kim's uh, paycheck. I was able to successfully print out Jim's paycheck and Tim's paycheck. And this is the behavior we want, right? We said, we accidentally forgot to give the commission employee that get earnings. So this 
is that safety net that a software engineer, not a software developer, will rely on to alert if we forgot to implement one of those key missing methods that were defined in a parent class. And when we started to flesh it out in the subclasses, we it's easy to miss those kind of things. So it's good to have these nets in there that, that alerts you when you're trying to compile and run your code that, hey, we couldn't actually get a earnings for Sam. And so it's gonna let me know, hey, there's an abstract method. We're missing an implementation of get earnings inside of commission employee. So what's happening here is when we inherit from an abstract class, we either are forced to define all of the abstract methods with actual implementation so it can become a concrete class so we can build instances of it, or we have to label that class itself as abstract because it inherits in a method that doesn't have a behavior. Which, I, so my two possible solutions is to say, oh, this is supposed to be abstract because we don't know how to do that yet. But more precisely, what we actually want to do is we actually like, oh, we forgot to implement this method, get earnings. And so our get earnings in this case is going to take the rate and multiply it by the sales. Oh, I gotta have a return statement in there it as well. Can it still extend employee? It can still extend employee, but then it has a consequence that we can't directly instantiate it. We can't create instances of it. We can't call it a constructor. So if we made it abstract, we would then have to create some other class that extends it that eventually does implement that method. So the idea is you can only have an instance, the motivating principle here is that you can only have a method I mean, you can only have an instance of something where all of the methods have definitions. So that if some code comes behind you and says, execute this method, you know what to do in response to that. If it's abstract, I mean, of course the JVM is gonna crash. You haven't told it what to do. <laughs> it can't assign an implementation. Okay, so now if I come behind it, that's going to catch the mistake. It's not going to print a zero paycheck for Sam now. It printed an error so I could fix the code, which is what we wanted. And now that it's fixed, Sam now has a paycheck. Okay, so that is abstract classes. So abstract methods are declared in a class, but left undefined. If at least one method in a class is abstract, that means the class must be abstract too. Abstract classes cannot be directly instantiated because they are incomplete or they're not well-defined. All the methods, local and inherited, must be defined, which are another way of saying defined or is non-abstract to be a concrete class. A subclass must extend an abstract class in order to construct an instance of it. So again, we talked about this linguistically with abstractions. Animals is an abstraction. And inside of animals, we have other abstractions like mammals and reptiles and things like that. And then inside of there, we can start actually creating concrete examples that fit into that Venn diagram. And abstract allows us to put a method in a class scope without having to implement it. Thus, it allows us to get that polymorphic behavior we're looking for. Excellent. And so this is just the implementations. Okay, so the next really big critical thing we have to talk about in this lecture is interfaces. So interfaces are similar yet very different than what the abstract keyword allows. So the one big thing, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I have to stress it, is uh, in Java, inheritance is single inheritance. There's only ever one parent. You can never inherit from more than one class. So like when I had hourly employee, and with the example where we had like, we wanted to do a commission hourly employee, I couldn't inherit from both commission and hourly. I would have to choose one and then add the new implementation in. So that's, that's, that's by design that we enforce single inheritance. Now, that's gonna be different with interfaces. We can actually implement as many interfaces as we want. So interfaces are, is also a way of creating an abstraction of having abstract methods. So whenever I say abstraction, that means I can have abstract methods. So abstract classes are one way to have abstract methods. Interfaces are another way to have abstract methods. Interfaces 
is goes gets defined in the same way we would define a class. So instead of using the class keyword, we would use the interface keyword. So there's three top level keywords we've seen like that. We've seen enum, we've seen class, and we've and we're about to see interface. So the big thing about an interface that distinguishes it from a class is that an interface only can have abstract methods. It can't have any instance fields and it can't have any concrete methods. So we saw in our abstract class, like employee, it could have well-defined methods, right? It could have methods that have bodies, that have implementation. And it could have fields like instance fields, like a name and address and a hire date and a birth date. Interfaces can't have any of that. An interface can only have abstract methods. The idea behind an interface is it allows a collection of unrelated classes to be grouped together. Because anything that implements an interface can be considered a member of that interface. We're gonna see, we're gonna extend our payroll example so that you can understand. So suppose that you produce this payroll uh, software that we just made and it was a great success. Everyone was getting paychecks and they're like, this is an awesome way for being able to manage everyone's uh, payments, but we want you to extend it so we can just use that as our POS system to be able to process things like receipts as well, to be able to process like being able to pay for uh, services and goods inside of the store. So instead of just being able to pay the employees, we might need to pay for a contractor to come in and install some shelving. We might have to be able to pay for our crates of milk to come in. And we want to expand our software to do that. Is that something that's reasonable? So these are all costly endeavors to the, to the cafe. And they want you to extend your application so that it can also support these other costly endeavors that aren't just the employee labor. So everyone understands the new specification requirement. So let's see how we can use interfaces to still keep that polymorphic behavior we're looking for. So again, I already talked about single inheritance versus multiple inheritance. Classes may have concrete and abstract methods. And whenever I say concrete method, it means it has an implementation uh, versus interfaces, which are only abstract methods. Okay, let's create an interface. Like I said, an interface looks just like a class. You replace the word class with interface. So let's create an interface. And usually it's very common with interfaces to end with something like able or ible or something like that, but it's not necessary. You can think of it as like a property that something can have. Like I'm flyable, I'm walkable, I'm flammable. Okay, so let's go and create payable here. There we go. And so here, what I'm, the, the goal of building the interface is in my payment system, I wanna group everything as a payable thing. So whether this was to pay for a contract, whether it's to pay for milk or to pay for my employees, they're all conceptually payable things. But besides being payable, besides being able to get the cost for this thing that has to be paid, there's no other shared relationship. Does, does that make sense? So like, for instance, we don't want to think of, there's not, in terms of the cafe, a crate of milk and the employees are only related in the fact that they both have to be paid with money, right? There's no other shared methods. There's no other shared data characteristics between the two. That is a clue to me when I should use an interface. When I want to group something as completely unrelated as employees and milk crates and say, I have to process them in a similar way. Let me create an interface that represents that these both share a quality of being payable. And then in order to be a payable thing, we have to define what does that mean? So we create an abstract method that we don't know how to define yet. That's gonna be, well, anything that's payable should be able to get its cost. So we're gonna create a method inside of the interface payable where we know it's gonna return back some money value, a double value, and every, anything that comes behind us and implements this interface will then be forced, if it wants to be concrete, if it wants to be instantiated, where it actually has that method definition. Okay, so now this is, kind of, this is an abstraction in and of itself. So now let's start using this abstraction. 
So let's go and create an invoice. So, and here we can see for interfaces, we use the keyword implements. Um, invoice. Let me spell that correctly. Okay, so let's see what we're doing with invoice. We're gonna create an invoice that's gonna represent the ability to buy that milk of uh, that, that crate of milks. So let's say every invoice is gonna have the following properties, which is completely different, as we said, from an employee. Let's say every invoice has a cost. Let's say every invoice has some kind of ID number. Let's say every invoice that the cafe has to pay for also has a description that helps identify what this invoice is. So completely different fields than what an employee has. We'll create a constructor that goes ahead and constructs an instance of an invoice. We're gonna create a two string method that allows us to go ahead and display the state of an invoice. But remember the, the goal is we wanna group invoices and we wanna group employees into like the same container to process at the same time so that we can list the sum of all payable things. So we can, compute the full cost of our paycheck or whatever the outgoing cost of our cafe is. So in order to do this, we're gonna implement that interface. And so the moment I implement this interface, that means I'm also, an invoice is also a member of payable, which means it inherits all of the abstract methods inside of payable, which means that if I want this to be a concrete class, it now has to implement all the abstract methods inside of payable. And so there's one abstract class in payable, get cost. So I'm just gonna return this total cost. Okay, so then let's do the same thing. Let's update employee now. So for employee, we can implement, oh, let me spell that correctly. Okay, implements. And here, this is a, and it's possible that I can both extend and implement. So it's possible I can have something like this. Let me do extends. Okay, so I can singly inherit and then I can implement any number of interfaces. Multiple interfaces are supported using commas and then single inheritance. So that's completely fine. Okay. So here though, since I'm implementing payable, I either can define it here in my abstract class or I'm forced to implement it in all my subclasses. Well, I'm gonna do a cheating method here. I know that the cost for any employee is its earnings. And I know that the earnings is abstract already here, but it has to be implemented by all the subclasses. So I'm gonna do this, public double, uh, get cost. I'm actually going to make this concrete by invoking the get earnings method, which itself is abstract. Public, yeah. What does it not like there? Get cost. And yeah, this doc. Oh, I have to return. There we go. Now we're returning our value there. Okay, let's actually test this out so that we can actually see an interface in action. So let's update, let's create a payment system now. So we're not gonna do an employee tester. We're gonna do payment system. Okay, so in our payment system, this is, we want something that was similar to employee tester. So we're gonna create Kim, we're gonna create Jim, we're gonna create Tim, we're gonna create Sam, just like we did before. But now we're also gonna create an invoice for that milk crate, where it's gonna be $250.34. It's gonna be called a crate of milk. 
and uh, as our description, and the ID number is going to be A123. And so here, because we now have that interface, we can group things that are based off of being payable. So I can create a data type called payable based off the interface name, that which can be an array. I can now group all these payable things. And let's say the purpose of this application is to create a final sum of everything that's been paid for. So let's start our sum at zero for each payable thing inside of our collection of costly things. Let's call its method get cost, the one method that's inside of payable and add that to our sum. And then we're also gonna just print it out. And what, what are we gonna print out? Notice we can have, we can pass in as a parameter inside of our method, a payable thing. Here, we'll just print it to the display, which is gonna invoke the two string method. And then when we're all done, we're gonna print out the total cost of not wages of total cost of payables. So let's go to our payment system. Let's compile that. Let's clear the terminal. Let's actually run it. And here, just like with employee tester, we successfully are able to actually derive a complete sum of all payable things. So if we were able to group it all together, start at zero and actually get a full report for the monthly output of our cafe. And we're able to do that because we use interfaces. So one of the big questions I know you'll have in the final is being able to identify when you should be able to use an interface versus an abstract class. So hopefully this gives a good example. Now, I might take the time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say now, this is the last lecture, I'm gonna finish these slides out. So when this gets posted online, you all have access to this video for the final. So I just have a couple more slides, but if for any reason you need to go, feel free to, to go since we're a little bit past time. But I think it's super critical that these last couple of slides are also part of this presentation. Okay, the last thing I wanna highlight is a concept that's going to clue in how we can design our object-oriented models. So what we've been doing up to this point is what we would consider a bottom-up design. So, and what I mean by that is we've probably been starting at concrete classes like, oh, and, and certainly uh, when you're building your own software, you're probably thinking about this. Like, for instance, let's say we wanted to build a dog for our application. Like, let's say we're building a video game. Your video game is like a, a simulator, like a pet simulator and you have dogs. So, but you might also have cats and you might also have like iguanas and hamsters and, all, and fish and all these other things. So you might start at the level you're at right now by saying, oh, I'm gonna create a dog class. And then you're like, a dog has a number of legs, a dog has like hair, a dog has, is alive. And you might start thinking of all the properties that a dog has. And then when you go to find your cat, and then when you go to define your hamster, you're like, oh, oh, these all have hair. And there's a lot of repeated practices. And so when you start seeing those, you're like, oh, let me, let me refactor my code, pull these properties out of my dog, out of my cat, out of my hamster, and then put this into a mammal class. Let me refactor so all that data is inside of mammal. And then while you're doing this and you're building a bird and you're building a fish, you're like, oh, all these things have is a lot. Let me refactor this out of mammal and then put this into animal so that as you still start making more classes, you can keep the, all the data in one particular place. So you're not duplicating your data. So this is probably, would you agree? This is probably the way that you've probably been designing your code. You start with concrete classes and then you start developing your abstractions. A big complexity of that is you're changing your code base a lot you're refactoring and you can't rely on these classes long-term with other developers because you're constantly mutating them in order to build out your code base. So that is poor engineering practices. So the way we've motivated the idea with starting with con uh, concrete classes and then like evolving the concept of abstracted interfaces for you has actually taught you to design in a backwards way, in a way that's not true to the way that we do it in industry. So to design with a top-down approach, we would have started with animal and say, okay, we're gonna build this pet sim. It's gonna have all sorts of animals. Let me think deeply about what every animal has. And then once I, once I thought deeply about that, then I go down to the next level 
where I start really abstract and I move towards concrete. I don't start at concrete and move towards abstract. So you want to practice doing a top-down design approach where you we start with an abstract class like animal, mammal, uh, uh, mammal, and then finally, uh, this should be dog, but whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, dog. And then finally dog, the concrete class. This is the way that homework seven works. However, that's not the full story either. The way that actual coding works is a top-down design, but you do it with interfaces, multiple interfaces. Uh, the disadvantage of this approach, where let's say you have an animal and a animal then has a mammal and then a mammal has, uh, has a dog, and let's say that all animals move. So we have an abstract method inside of move. And let's say, for instance, we get into the strange the, the strange classifications of where an animal can move in multiple ways. Like let's say we were creating a penguin. This approach doesn't support penguins because penguins can walk and they can swim, right? There's two ways of moving. So what you can think of interfaces as is as like a list of methods, like an API that each method can support. So the way that you wanna start building your objects out when you get to 2120, and moving forward, if you start following this approach, you'll be so much better in the long run. Start identifying everything as properties. Like if I'm thinking about building an animal, well, that animal might have wings. If it has wings, I'm gonna create an interface where I have an abstract method called fly, or I might have an animal that has fins, right? And so I'm gonna create an interface that's fins and has an abstract method called swim. And I might have an interface called bipedal, which, might be able to walk or hop or jump, or I might have quadpedal, which allows me to gallop. Or I might have multipedal, which allows me to crawl like a spider or a centipede. So notice what this allows me to do is not even start thinking of things in terms of classes, but just collections of methods. And then when it comes time, I, and then I'm starting in this really abstract space, then when it comes time for me to start building my application, Look at the flexibility I have. I have even more flexibility than the other example I showed you. Here, when I go to define a chicken, a chicken can implement wings and legs. A chicken uh, where, well, this would be bipedal. So let's change this to legs just so it, it matches. So here, now that means in order to be a chicken, I have to implement fly and I have to implement walk, hop, and jump. And so this provides the best mechanism because now a chicken is something that is a member with wings and it's also a member with legs. And anything that I group together, it can be grouped into both those different groups. So this is the way that you should start thinking about code if you're really gonna be performant and excel in an object-oriented design. You can only really start thinking and breaking it down once we've covered all these concepts. Also notice what we're creating here are miniature APIs. Like the APIs we were seeing with classes, that's effectively designed by interface. And this is a big, big solid principle in terms of software engineering. Anyway, that is the uh, end of our lecture for uh, the last lecture. So we have covered all the concepts that you should need to be able to be successful in the final. I'll go ahead and have that published uh, sometime soon. Excellent, any questions before we dismiss? I will end the recording here.